Good afternoon, viewers. Embassy of India, Moscow welcomes you on this special event under Azadi Ka Mahotsav celebrations. Here in Russia, we have more than 16,000 plus uh, Indian students studying in various disciplines of science in universities all across Russia. This event is specially oriented towards these students. Viewers, as you know, 21st February is the birth anniversary of one of India's greatest scientists and leader, Dr. Shad Santi Sharu Bhatnagar. May I now request Vigyan Prasad to play a small video about Dr. Shanti Sharu Bhatnagar, please. Dr. Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar played an important role in the promotion of industrial research movement in the country. He was the first Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research CSIR, and established a total of 12 national laboratories of international repute. His contribution to the field of applied chemistry is significant. He is credited with setting up the National Research Development Corporation. In 1928, he and friend K.N. Mathur developed the Bhatnagar Mathur Magnetic Interference Balance, which was at the time considered to be one of the most sensitive instruments measuring magnetism and related properties. He was awarded Padma Bhushan by the Government of India in 1954. In 1958, to honor his name and legacy, the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research CSIR, instituted the Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology for scientists who have made significant contributions in various branches of science. As you just saw, Dr. Bhatnagar has many firsts to his name. He was the founder director of Council for Scientific and Industrial Research established in 1942. One can imagine his vision, efforts, and stature that he created CSIR prior India's independence. Sir Santishru Bhatnagar played a significant part along with Dr. Homi Jahangir Baba, Professor P.C. Mahalobnis, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, and many others in building of post-independence science and technology infrastructure and in the, in the growth of India's science and technology. He was also the first chairman of University Grants Commission. He was also Secretary, Ministry of Education and as Educational Advisor to Government of India. Dr. Bhatnagar played, played an important role both in the constitution and deliberation of the Scientific Manpower Committee report of 1948, which served as an important policy document for the government to plan the post-independent science and technology infrastructure. To mention his academic contribution, Dr. Bhatnagar was also a university professor for 19 years, from 1921 to 1940, first at Banaras Hindu University and then at Punjab University. And he had a reputation of a very inspiring teacher, and it was as a teacher that he himself was most happy. He was also the one-man commission appointed in 1951 to negotiate with oil companies for starting refineries. And this ultimately led to the establishment of many oil refineries in different parts of India. He induced many individuals and organizations to donate liberally for the cause of science and education. Dr. Bhatnagar did considerable work in applied in industrial chemistry and solved many industrial problems for companies like Delhi Cloth Mills, J.K. Mills Kanpur, Ganesh Floor Mills, Tata Oil Mills, Bombay Steel Brothers, and many others. However, Dr. Bhatnagar persistently refused to receive any monetary benefit arising out of this applied and industrial chemical research for his personal ends and utilized all such remunerations for strengthening research facilities at his universities. Besides all his scientific prowess, Dr. Bhatnagar loved writing poetry, particularly in Urdu. And as you just saw, he was awarded the Padm Vibhushan in 1954 by the President of India. In his honor, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research has instituted a prize, Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Prize, which is given 
to the most outstanding contribution in various science di disciplines to Indian scientists every year. Viewers today to give an expert talk on the occasion of the birth anniversary of Sir Shant Sarup Bhatnagar, we have another distinguished scientist and the current Director General of CSIR, Dr. Shekhar Mande. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much for honoring us uh, on this occasion and coming uh, for this talk. Dr. Mande is a structural and computational biologist. He holds his PhD in molecular biophysics from Indian Institute of Science. Besides working as hands-on scientist in various significant laboratories, he has also headed National Center for Cell Sciences in Pune, India. He was also awarded in 2005 the prestigious Santi Sharup Bhatnagar Prize for Biological Sciences, which you know is the highest science award given for outstanding contribution. He's a member of numerous prestigious bodies and heads various committees on science and technology. May I now request you, sir, to enlighten the viewers on this important occasion. Thank you very much, Dr. Shotia. First of all, it's a great delight for me to be able to be present with all of you on the occasion of birth anniversary of Sir Shantisuru Bhatnagar. I'm enormously honored that the Embassy of India in Moscow and all of you chose me to give this talk today about Indian science. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mostly restrict myself to post-independent science that has happened in the country and how we have developed an ecosystem which Sir Shantisuru Bhatnagar and as correctly mentioned by Dr. Shotia, Dr. Homi Baba and Dr. Vikram Sarabhai played very, very important role in shaping India's SNT in the post-independent world. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually talk to you about uh, generally about how science and technology developed in the country. But also I'm going to talk to you about what all kind of work we have done uh, during this period, uh, what did not exist at a time of independence uh, and so on and so forth. But before we come to independence, uh, I would like to note that uh, Sir Shantisur Bhatnagar was not only a very influential figure in founding CSIR and NRDC, but also he had profound influence on Banaras Hindu University, of which he actually wrote the Kulgit on the university, Punjab University in Lahore, where he carried out a very seminal work, which he worked very also closely with oil industry and thereby demonstrating to the world and to the country that basic science and research goes hand in hand also with industrial research and discoveries and so on and so forth. Dr. Bhatnagar was also uh, largely responsible in the formation, during the formation of Atomic Energy Commission and TIFR Mumbai. And we will see that during my talk a little later. But before I go to post-independent era, I want to trace general uh, history of Indian innovations. And I'm going to trace it for roughly about 300,000 years old. So three lakh years old, even before humans actually started making colonies and how humans actually used to live in uh, our subcontinent. And this is a picture that I had took. I had gone for a trek in December in the Aravallis and I found a site, rather it was known this site, but I mean, like, uh, it was knowledge to me, very close to Delhi, about an hour's drive from Delhi. There are plenty of such artifacts that I've shown you on this particular figure exist. The artifact that I'm actually trying to show you here is a tool that prehistoric humans typically use for foraging their food. So this is, I recall when I said that before we started forming colonies, humans used to use tools. They used to roam around in groups of 10 or 20, and they would actually try to get food from whatever they could get. And they used tools like this. And it is believed that this tool was made using something called a levelized technology. It is dated something like 100 to 300,000 years old. But if we fast forward, so it essentially shows that many people have actually lived in this particular era in our geographical region. And when we fast forward to roughly about 2,500 BC, 2,500 to 3,000 BC, and by then we already had begun 
forming colonies. Roughly about 15,000 years ago, humans started forming colonies, adopted agriculture, and started also rearing cattle and so on and so forth. But two and a half to 3,000 BC, the culture was at its peak. And the statue that you see here is a very iconic statue that was discovered in the Mohenjo-daro and Harappa excavations. This statue is made up of bronze. And remember, we are talking roughly about 5,000 years ago. This goes on to show that casting of metals and making metal alloys was known even 5,000 years ago in our own subcontinent. And in fact, this statue was made by a technique called lost wax techniques, which is used even today to make artifacts uh, in today's, uh, today's times. And actually shows how advanced our civilizations have been in our geographical era. So if you ask a question that how did actually human migrations really begin in India or in our subcontinent, multiple studies actually have proposed multiple theories. And the two theories which are actually most prominent are the ones that have been proposed by David Reich and Lalji Singh and Thangraj in Hyderabad. And that actually appeared on the cover of Nature some years ago. And the other one has been published by Professor Ashok Singh's group about four years ago, once again in Nature. And both of them argue that humans have actually existed in our neighborhood for a very, very long period. And while they were uh, settled here, they also made significant advances in science and technology and adopted these as tools for our progress. And two examples I showed are only at the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many such examples that we actually see even today across India, which have been dominant since the last four or 5,000 years. But we fast forward now to roughly about 1947, there's a period what we can rightfully call as the Dark Ages. In the Dark Ages, leading to about 1947, we were denied the benefits or the fruits of modern and science and technology. In fact, we were exploited so badly by colonial powers that by the time our colonial powers left our shores, our contribution to world GDP was less than 2%. And before the colonial powers came to India, our share to the world's GDP was of the order of about 25 to 27 percent. Now, there's such a drop in world's GK, our share in world GDP, that simply because we had been exploited right and left. We had no industry left here. We had no institutions of higher learning uh, which were here. And we were completely dependent upon colonial powers for anything for what we wanted so much so that we are also not dependent, self-dependent on the food production. And just before our colonial powers left us, four years before that, there's a very infamous Bengal famine in which lakhs and lakhs of people actually died. Imagine today people dying of famine, which we cannot even imagine. Then a society like this, when there's plenty of agriculture, there's plenty of land and plenty of water available, how could people die of famine in those times. But thankfully, by adopting science and technology post 1947, we have been able to overcome all those difficulties. And this is what actually we are going to see now in the next roughly 20-25 minutes, how we have done that. So we begin with era of institutional building, which was an era immediately after 1947. And in fact, institutions like CSIR, the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, of which I have the privilege to be the director general today, was founded by Sir Shanti Suru Bhatnagar. He was our first director general. But since 1947, very soon, many other organizations came into being, such as Indian Council of Agricultural Research, Indian Council of Medical Research, the Department of Atomic Energy, Defense, Department of Space, and so on and so forth. So many of these together today constitute our overall science and technology ecosystem in the country. But to look at uh, the CSI's own evolution, we recall that in 1933, there was an editorial that was written in Nature that India should have publicly supported 
SNT system. And the British government conveniently forgot about this particular editorial until the person that I show you here, uh, Honorable Divan Bahadur, Sir Accord Ramaswamy Mudliya, this person was a member of the Viceroy's Executive Council. And there, he literally lobbied to the British to start a publicly funded SNT organization in the country. And principally through his effort, the Board of Scientific and Industrial Research was formed in 1940, which was then metamorphosed into Industrial Research Utilization Committee in 1941, and eventually the same metamorphosed itself as Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in 1942. The Council of Scientific and Industrial Research then was registered as an autonomous society under the 1860 Act, as called CSIR, as we know it today. Sir Shanti Suru Bhatnagar was invited to be the first Director General, given his own academic eminence and given his own connect with the industry, it was appropriate that only he could come and be the first Director General of CSIR. Sir Bhatnagar himself, some years later, wrote in Nature that what would be the overall idea of CSIR and I'm going to quote from him and he says, the scope of work in each laboratory of CSIR could perhaps be described to be of the form of a continuous spectrum at one end of which research work of the purest academic type and of the highest quality is carried out and at the other the technical development of processes and equipment proceeds by stages." Unquote. So Sir Bhattnagar realized that for a country to progress significantly, we must do both high-end and very deep fundamental work. At the same time, we must also do translational work that can reach the society very, very effectively. Both these kinds of things actually were possible to exist, coexist in CSIR. Bhatnagar, of course, had a very strong support from the then lawmakers at the highest level. But Bhatnagar also had support from the industrial houses. And he had very close interaction with the industrial house of Tata's then. And he appealed to Tata's for a grant to start CSIR. And Tata's were very generous that one fifth of the grant of CSIR, when CSIR started five laboratories, was given by the Tata Industrial House. And not only that, the Tatas also made an appeal to general public to raise money for scientific research in the country, which then would be given to CSIR. And through this appeal, what today we call as public crowdsourcing, through this crowdsourcing, Tatas were able to raise about 44,000 rupees in 1942. And this is a letter by Sir J.R.D. Tata to Sir Shantisuru Bhattnagar, dated roughly 1951. It says that out of crowdsourcing, he has been able to raise 44,000 rupees, which is mostly realized from the Mercantile Association of Calcutta. But then he goes on adding one very interesting statement. And he says, I am disappointed that the response from the general public has been so poor particularly from the general public of Jamshedpur, whose contribution amounts surprisingly to a low figure of only rupees 501. So he was rather pained that although people had contributed generously for the support of science and technology, the Jamshedpur people had not risen to the same level. And in fact, JRD Tata continued to be associated with CSIR for a very long period. And what you see here is he chairing the executive council of CSIS National Aerospace Laboratories in Bangalore. And that program, he significantly contributed to shape to its present level, what we do today. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But beyond the foundation of CSIR, we also had to make sure that we start actually our programs very uh, in the right earnest in many different directions. There was a need to start institutes for fundamental research and Homi Baba came forward and with full support of Sir Shanti Suru Bhatnagar, they were able to convince Tata's to start what is now called as the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research today in Mumbai. 
So in 1945, Sir Dora B. Tata Trust decided to sponsor the TIFR in cooperation with the government of Bombay and government of India through CSIR gave very generous grant to start this particular proposal. In the first year, about 10,000 rupees. But by the time TFR had completed two or three years, this grant had been raised from government of India to about 75,000 rupees. And what you see here, during the foundation stone laying of TFR in 1954, Shantiswaru Bhattanaga reading a lecture. And in the audience, you have likes of Humi Jahangir Bhava, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Moraji Desai, and GRD Tata. So basically, this was the foundation of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. But at the same time, it was also realized that country had to have a strong atomic energy program. And once again, with the support of likes of Sir K. S. Krishnan, Sir Shanti Suru Bhatnagar, and with the dynamic Homi Jahangir Baba on the scene, it was decided that India would have a strong atomic energy program. And the atomic energy program of India the discussions began in the National Physical Laboratory in Delhi and it arose out of TIFR in 1948. And for atomic energy, once again CSR came forward and granted them rupees 32,400 to train a team of 10 scientists in nuclear physics. So this team of nuclear scientists were sent abroad, they were trained, they were brought back to the country and with that nucleus, India's first atomic energy commission was set up in 1948 in the Department of Scientific Research. If we could move forward, fast forward to today's date, what we see is that around the time of 1950s and 1960s, many educational organizations in the country were founded. Many universities, the new IITs started emerging and so on and so forth. And to the extent that today we have in the SNT ecosystem, on one hand, we have the strategic organizations such as the defense, the space, and atomic energy. On the other hand, we have excellent human resource development agencies such as IITs and universities. But in between the two, we also have national laboratories uh, of the government, which are essentially CSIR, ICMR, ICAR, and the autonomous organizations of Department of Science and Technology and Department of Biotechnology. So in a sense, what we have evolved today are the fruits that was being sown in the 1930s and 1940s about the foundations of different SNT organizations in the country. And through this, what have we achieved in the last 75 years? As we celebrate Azadi Ka Amrit Matsa, we must recall what have been achievements of science and technology in the growth of our country. And let us look at a few examples of those. The first and foremost, Actually, what you see is although our GDP was very, very, very low in 1947, it has risen dramatically in recent years. And the GDP continues to grow continuously. To the extent, today, the Honorable Prime Minister of India desires that our GDP should cross 5 trillions in a few years from now. Our life expectancy at the time of independence was of the order of about 30 years or so, 32 years or so. It has risen dramatically to about 70 years in recent times. The number of children who used to die below the age of 40 during the 1950s was so high. And that has very dramatically dropped down today. So if you look at all the economic parameters, and if you look at all the social parameters, indeed, we appear to have made a very significant progress. And just to remind you, about the time that India became independent, about 60 or 70 different countries became independent around the world. But India stands out as that country in which a great progress has been observed for its people and large share of that must go to the adoption of science and technology as our strategy for the growth of our society. And let us look at a few examples how we have done in the science and technology based solutions in these last 50 years, last 75 years. If we actually go to a pre independent era, this era can be characterized as that of individual excellence. The people like Ramans, Sahas, and Boses 
who really excelled and made themselves known on the world stage through their sheer creativity. But as soon as the colonial powers left us, there was an immediate problem of becoming self-reliant. And the first few years after independence, we spent on trying to become self-reliant. Then came an era when the world started seeing us as one of the global powers and therefore possibly a threat and therefore all kinds of technologies were denied to India and that era was actually can be defined by developing our own technologies in this particular time period. And today we all aspire to be global SNT leader in all aspects of science and technology. I'm going to give you a few examples of how principles of SNT were applied for the benefit of our society. The first example, of course, is that of implementation of democracy. We adopted inclusive democracy as the principal growth, a principal vehicle of our growth. And in order to make sure that every citizen had the right to vote and every citizen could go and exercise his or her own right, the first thing that we had to make sure was if one had voted, what was the proof that one person had voted? And for that, as you see here gloriously, we developed what is called as the indelible ink. And the indelible ink was developed in CSIS National Physical Laboratory in Delhi. And via NRDC, mention of which was made in the video, it was transferred to Mysore Ink Private Limited. And Mysore Ink, even today, give CSIR about 1 crore rupees every year as royalty. So at any point of time, the elections held in India, CSIR gets royalty out of the indelible ink. But many of you would recall that the period, the first 20 odd years beyond independence were extraordinarily difficult time. And especially the period roughly about 1962 to 1965 or 67 was a very, very difficult period. There are successive droughts and India had not become self-sufficient in our own agriculture. And it is at that time we were led by a very far reaching visionary leader, somebody called C. Subramaniam. He, along with Norman Borlaug and M. S. Swaminathan, together decided that they would attempt to make India completely self-reliant on food. And what unfolded was something of a miracle. We know today that the green revolution of India has made India not only self-reliant, but also we today now produce excess food and it's extraordinary, uh, extraordinary achievement of Indian science of adopting all the local agricultural practices and making technological interventions in agriculture to make sure that we become self-reliant on food and the successive droughts happened in 1965, 1966, 1967, they did not eventually have much effect on India's capability of feeding our people. But an important component of Green Revolution was not only this. One of the important components of Green Revolution was also mechanization of agriculture and also development of agri-pesticides. And that mantle of mechanization and agri-pesticides fell upon CSIR. And what CSIR would do in such a period is CSIR rolled out the first indigenous tractor called Swaraj from its Central Mechanical Engineering Research Institute. To the extent that the people who made the Swaraj tractor, they eventually came out of CSIR and founded their own company. Today, we call this phenomena as spin-off. So a spin-off from CSIS laboratory makes sure that we now also can mechanize agriculture on our own. And a large number of pesticides were also found in CSIR laboratories then and given to the companies for large-scale implementation across. One particular issue I told you in my earlier slides was children below the age of five dying large number of children below the age of five dying at a time of independence. And for that, we had to ensure that we also develop infant food. And infant food in India, there were certain challenges to make. Some of you might recall 
that most of the milk available across different countries is essentially cow milk well that in india most of it is buffalo milk but the storage of buffalo milk and making infant food formulations out of buffalo milk was an important challenge in fact all the experts in the world including someone called william ridet from new zealand and experts from scotland who visited india in the 1940s and 1950s dismissed the idea that buffalo milk buffalo milk can be converted into a formulation that can have a long shelf life now this became a major technological challenge for our scientists how do you convert buffalo milk into a formulation that can stay very long and just as the green revolution was being unfolded across the country another revolution was happening in anand and in gujarat what is also called as the white revolution but the problem of converting buffalo milk into milk powder was eventually solved in csir's central food technological research institute in mysore so amul there is the anand uh, cooperative cooperative of all the milk farmers and cftri together came up with this solution of converting buffalo milk into milk powder so that it can be transported across india and could stay for several days and in fact in the early days amul milk powder tins many of the young people here your parents would remember that you used to get tins like this and used to carry a logo of cftri mysore at that came the impetus for all of this came directly from the report of a committee that government of india had formed to convert milk into something what we call as infant food formulation or also milk which could be transported across different parts of the country so what i have told you is two major technological achievements one that of green revolution and one that of white revolution which actually form the core ethos of our country that whenever we have been challenged to do something we have actually always risen to the occasion and we have done that whenever our society has faced challenges we have risen and found technological solutions to that what i show you here is a similar revolution that is currently being unfolded in the state of jammu and kashmir as you know the state of jammu and kashmir has seen very difficult time period but we have to ensure that the people have means of self sustenance there especially the farmers and what csr undertook on its own a few years ago is the cultivation of lavender in jammu and kashmir and what you see here is now at a very large scale lavender is being cultivated across jammu and kashmir because there's a geographically very geo geoclimatic region is suitable for cultivation of lavender and the lavenders which are high oil yielding varieties they yield about 5 to 6 times more income to the farmers than a traditional crops and as we speak larger and larger area is coming under cultivation for lavender oil in the country in the in jammu and kashmir and what actually i had myself a chance to visit pulwama and kupwara in july last year and i could see myself uh, with my own eyes the kind of revolution that is unfolding as even we speak today so what i said is that whenever there have been periods of challenges before the country whether feeding the poor or whether giving infants proper food nutritious food or any other kinds the science and technology community in the country has always stood up on its feet and made itself count to provide technological solutions for the country and its own people so about 2 years ago when the covid-19 pandemic broke out across the globe it was to be expected that india science and technology community once again would gather its courage and address the issue more effectively in mitigating covid-19 pandemic and we are very proud that the kind of solutions that emerged out of different organizations in the country whether be it icar whether be it iits whether be department of biotechnology institutes or csir labs together they have made india an extraordinarily proud nation the kind of innovations that have been made during covid-19 are phenomenal i just want to give you two or three different examples that came out of csir 
for example when the testing was only pcr based rt pcr based the csr labs decided that we could actually speed up the testing and bring down the cost if we used something called a crispr cas method and based on crispr cas method csr laboratory the institute of genomics and integrative biology in delhi made the first crispr cas based diagnostics for covid testing is a lateral flow assay is a paper strip based assay that actually generates result whether a person is positive or negative similarly a minor tweak in the swab collection method before rt pcr also saves about 50% time and actually saves cost by about 30 to 40% and this we call as a dry swab method was developed in the center for cellular and molecular biology in hyderabad apart from diagnostics csis scientists also recognized very early in fact much ahead of the world that the virus essentially is airborne while rest of the world was worrying about touching surfaces and hygienizing the place and sanitizing the places for the surfaces we already had recognized the virus is essentially predominantly airborne and for airborne virus if we actually mix air with fresh air there's less probability of transmission of the virus from person to person and for that we came up with ventilation guidelines that have been circulated across india to many different offices residential areas schools malls and so on and so forth similarly if the virus is spreading through the air through respiratory droplets we can also sanitize them by exposing them to uv and what we have done is that by retrofitting the air handling units in many different buildings we have been able to actually sanitize the air handling units or the ducts using uv light and the most showcase solution that we have actually installed is that in the parliament of india in the central hall so what csr scientists actually did then multiple laboratories together they came together studied the aspect of how covid-19 virus spreads through the air did calculations and experiments to show how far virus can spread the respiratory droplets can spread and how it can be actually sanitized by variety of methods and this has yielded some very very fascinating solutions which can eventually reduce the probability of transmission from person to person similarly when the country was facing shortage of oxygen the csr scientists together made something called pressure vacuum swing adsorption to generate medical grade oxygen and a total 100 about 120 plants have now been commissioned across the country by csir using something like 500 liter per minute capacity of generation of oxygen and today we are very proud that organizations like drdo bhl lnt csir all of us have worked together and ensured that no district of the country would now ever feel shortage of oxygen in the coming times in fact all the organizations together joined hands and made sure that every district there is at least one oxygen plant so these are the kind of confidence that we have worked with in the last 75 years as i told you in the beginning in 1947 we had been robbed of all our resources and we have been literally raised like slaves with the mentality that anything good that happens only happens in the west we also had been told that we did not have our own culture and the modern culture necessarily comes from west and all of these were false narratives we realized in 75 years that what we had been being told was all false and in fact a very strong culture existed here much before anywhere else in the world and a very strong science and technology practice have existed here much before anyone else could imagine and these practices had actually made one of our culture as one of the greatest cultures on the planet let us also look at some work i'm going to take only two examples of when we talk of science and technology 
of how people are creative and how people even advance the frontiers of knowledge. But when we talk of that, we must once again remember that every possible honor that could come on the people who have been extraordinarily creative is also being denied in the modern times by the West to Indian scientists. And I want to give you two dominant examples. The first one is that of Professor G. N. Ramachandran. Now this person, what you see here today, and on the, on the board what he has drawn here are two fantastic examples of creativity. One, that of an alpha helix that was proposed by none other than Linus Pauling. And Linux Pauling got Nobel Prize for the structure of polypeptides then. Very close in time to the discovery of the structures of polypeptides was also a discovery of the DNA structure by Watson and Crick and Franklin and Morins. The four of them discovered the structure of the DNA and they also got Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin did not get Nobel Prize because she died before the Nobel Prizes were announced. But nonetheless, Watson, Crick and Maurice Wilkins together got Nobel Prize for DNA. But yet, at the same time, another very important biopolymer that called collagen. Its structure was being worked out in University of Madras by none other than the Ramachandran. No less significant than the structure of alpha helix or that of DNA or RNA. And the structure was elucidated, elucidated in a remote corner of the world called Madras. And a beautiful structure, a discovery no less in creativity than the structure of alpha helix or that of the DNA. But yet, Ramchandran went a step ahead. And when his structure was criticized by some of the big wigs at that particular time, he devised a method called a validation method of protein structures that is used even today. And it's called as the Ramchandran plot. And by the sheer name, the Ramchandran plot, he has become immortal for all the biochemists and biophysicists around the world. In fact, if you open up any textbook of biophysics or biochemistry, any textbook, in the first few pages, you will see a reference to the Ramchandran plot. So Ramchandran, in a sense, is immortal by his contributions of the structure of collagen and that of the Ramchandran plot. And in fact, many of us very fondly say, many of the Nobel laureates, you may be able to recall their names years later. You may not be able to recall their names years later. But Ramchandran's name, nobody would be not able to recall. There's one name that everyone would always fondly say around the world, all the students of biophysics and biochemistry, wherever they are, wherever they are taught the basics, fundamentals of biochemistry or biophysics, they would always recall the name of Ramchandran. While not being able to recall many of the Nobel laureates' words. So his far above Nobel Prize is what we believe. Similarly, there's yet another unsung hero and his name was Shambhunath Day. Shambhunath Day is truly the discoverer of what is called as endotoxins. Toxins are the molecules that are secreted by bacteria and they have a very bad effect on human health. And in fact, Shambhunath Day for the first time discovered toxin from Vibrio cholerae and went on to show that this toxin actually has ill properties on human cells and therefore when you have cholera, one gets dysentery and other things. The entire field of toxins was initiated by Shambhunath Day in Calcutta. He was nominated for Nobel Prize a number of times. Unfortunately, he did not get so and therefore he still remains an unsung hero in the world of infectious diseases and in the words of toxins that what we talk of today. So having said that, what we have been able to achieve in the 75 years of Indian independence through primarily vehicles of science and technology, we must also sit back and look upon the aspirations of the nation for the coming time. And I'm going to put before you only two aspirational statements or rather three aspirational statements. One, how do we make sure 
that we reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. For sustainable living in future, we must reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. And one possible way of doing that is biojet fuels. CSIS laboratory, the Indian Institute of Petroleum has been able to make biofuels and has been able to supply them to some of the airlines, including one passenger airline that flew from Dehradun to Delhi, or some of the Indian Air Force airlines, and also getting regulatory approvals by Sembilac very recently. Making India only the second country in the world to fire biofuels fight with indigenous fuels. So we are very proud that the future that appears to be around a corner, we will be significant players in that particular future and the globe. India also is a signatory to Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And there we have actually committed that we will try to maintain ourselves within 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade temperature rise in the next few years. In fact, in the recent Glasgow summit, the Honorable Prime Minister even made more ambitious statements. And to realize those statements, the Honorable Prime Minister also on the 15th August from the ramparts of the Red Fort announced that there will be a hydrogen mission in the country, a green hydrogen mission. And India has stated his aspirations on green hydrogen mission as hydrogen 212, that is our ability to generate hydrogen that less than $2 a kg, to store and distribute hydrogen at one less than $1 a kg, and to replace the incumbent fossil te technology by hydrogen with return on investment less than two years. And these are the aspirations of our people. And this is exactly what the SNT community of the country is working towards. And last example that I want to give is the future of telecommunications, the future of surveys, the future of remote sensing, and the future of disaster recovery. And that future lies in what are called as high altitude platform technologies, or these are the unmanned air vehicles, which fly roughly about 20 kilometers above the surface of the earth. And this we believe would be the future and a serious competition to the satellites so that the UAVs could eventually hopefully replace all the satellites. And once again, we have taken firm steps towards this direction. And in another, about another month, we hope that we would demonstrate a scaled down version of HAPS in either Bangalore or in Hyderabad. So this year, we have plans of demonstrating a scaled down version flight of these HAPS. And if you are successful, who knows that future once again, India will be able to lead the world into that future in which less dependence on satellites and more dependence on unmanned air vehicles is placed uh, on the planet. What I actually told you in my last uh, 45 minutes or so is that we have had rich traditions of science and technology through ages, even in the prehistoric ages, and we find evidences of that all over the country. We have been a very affluent society until the arrival of colonial powers from the West, and affluence was principally driven by strong s &T. Of course, I should also add I, science, technology, and innovation. Although we missed the fruits of the first industrial revolution, and because we were under occupation by colonial powers then, as soon as the colonial powers left, we have placed emphasis on science and technology-based development, and as I told you with a few examples, it has yielded very rich dividends. And as we continue our journey, as we actually look into the future, as we define our own aspirations for the future, as we want a world, a peaceful place for all the humanity to live, as we want the world, a peaceful place for all species to survive. To that future, we are making a very firm and a very determined march. And we want to lead that future through science and technology and innovation from India. Our focus, therefore, must be on the future of humanity and that of our sustainable planet. If we put our heads together, 
if we put our might together if we put all of us together i am pretty sure that india would be a global leader in science technology and innovation in the coming 25 years by the by the time the country is 100 years old in 2047 we will be a leading global power in terms of science and technology and innovation and for a peaceful existence a peaceful existence of all entities on the planet thank you all so very much for patiently listening to me thank you very much thank you sir you touched various aspects of history and evolution of science and technology in modern india we are sure the viewers especially the younger generation are inspired watching this today and will work to take forward the vision of sir santi suru bhatnagar and many other leaders you mentioned in your talk it was also the vision of sir santi suru bhatnagar that scientific solutions should be oriented towards solving the problems of our society and industrial growth of our nation so today's lecture is most significant to fulfill this vision of our leaders on behalf of embassy of india moscow we thank dgcsir for this inspiring talk we also thank vigyan prasar for all the support in organizing this lecture and taking the country forward by popularizing science technology and innovation namaskar and happy viewing